Good morning. It is 1134 on this Wednesday, the 26th of January. Welcome to Central Valley Talk Live. Austin Reed coming to you from our Tower District Studios inside the Mike Briggs building. We thank you for joining us. We're going to be live and local until just after like four o'clock today. So make sure you stay with us. We have a bunch of guests in store for you. Hey, my first guest joining us once again in our Tower District Studios. Give it up for Jim Horton, the executive director, the founder of the Zachary Horton Foundation. Is executive director? Uh, I think my my business card says president. Oh, president. Yeah, yeah, the executive director, that would probably be Roscoe. That's Roscoe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Roscoe, by the way, is is uh, Zach's dog. It was Zach's dog, yeah. a little French bulldog. Yeah. 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 He, he's he's a he's he, a who. Yeah. Yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyone that uh, follows us on Facebook has certainly seen um, pictures of Roscoe. He's the mascot. Yes, he is. Yeah. Um, Jim, welcome back. Thank good you. To, good to see you. Uh, busy. You've been busy. It it has been incredible. Uh, we. It's it's just uh, opportunities have exploded uh, for us, and and of course you're uh, again. Thank you so much for agreeing to join our board. Yeah, I, that's right. I don't think I we publicly made that announcement on the air. So yeah, I I'm honored. I'm humbled. Um, I think you know the Zachary Horton Foundation has been around for a little over a year. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and like you said, just the last few months, things have been blowing up. Ab- absolutely. And, and a lot of that, it, it has to, it has to be a, as I think as a, uh, as a, as a foundation develops, uh, what you think it's going to be, what you hope that it can be mm-hmm. often changes. Yeah. And the people that have become part of our board and, that the the thoughts, the energy, the passion that they bring to it uh, has helped us to grow exponentially. So it's yeah, it's 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 very thrilling, uh, you know, where you know where where we're going. So for our viewers that have not seen you before, let's begin with the story of the Zachary Horton Foundation. Sure. Um, uh, my son Zach uh, passed away uh, just a little over two years ago. It was uh, January seventh, uh, and you know to say that that changes your life when you have a, a child pass is is an understatement. It, it it changes every dream, every hope, every vision that you had for your future. Uh, we just. Uh, you know, came through uh, Thanksgiving and, and Christmas. There is never going to be a holiday that'll be the same mm-hmm. with the, with with the loss of Zach. But but very soon after Zach passed, with within a week or so, his mother and I decided that we had to create something uh, in in his memory, something to bring uh, to bring some meaning to to his passing. And so we decided to create the foundation. And, and the mission of the Zachary Horton Foundation is to end the stigma of addiction. And w- we aim to do that by, by offering uh, hope, love, and acceptance to families and individuals that suffer from this uh, terrible disease of addiction. Uh, the way that we do that for, for families is uh, we are uh, instrumental now in putting together uh, some family support groups. Uh, Austin, in fact, um, uh, an, another board member of of ours uh, is working with his school district, and hopefully, within the next um, within the next month, we'll begin those uh, parent support groups. Uh, you know, r- right there on on the campus of their school for the, for their district. Um, so, so that's that's very exciting for us because one of the things that that we missed out on. Uh, with with our family, when when we became aware of 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 Zach's problems, we had no idea where to go. We had no idea what to do, and we would look we would look online. and And back then, three years ago, when his problems first started, there was there was nothing locally for us. So we wanted to create something to fill in the gaps that we experienced. So one of those things is uh, to create on our website 
um, a, a page of resources, of local resources uh, that are available, and that is growing all the time. So we want if someone is in, if someone is in need, if there's something happening in your in your family and, and you don't know where to go, you can look one place. You don't have to research uh, uh, 20 different addresses and make 20 different calls. It's it's all right there in one place. And if you need some help and guidance, we get calls all the time now. So we're able to support families that, that call us and say, hey, what should we do? Where should we go? Uh, you, you, you know, how do we navigate th- these waters? So that that was one of the things was, was having that those those resource pages. The the other thing uh, for parents was s- supplying uh, some sense of connection and 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 support. So we're kind of implementing that with the families. This is going to be really exciting as 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 time goes on. Now with the individual that's suffering from from substance use, if if they're younger, um, being able to Wow, being able to have young people see themselves as other than worthless. Oftentimes, oftentimes when someone suffers from substance use disorder, which we used to call addiction all the time, but the, the medical term is substance use disorder, once they begin to get sober, once they begin to get healthier, that's when their mind starts to clear up and they start to begin to uh, uh, make good decisions now. But along with those good decisions that they're making, now that their mind clears up, they're also aware of all the bridges they've burned. They're aware of how many people they've let down. They're aware of all the family destruction, all the destruction with their friends. That's a heavy burden for a, an 18, 19, 20-year-old or a 26-year-old that's been using for 10 years because they don't have the structure in their mind of how to so oftentimes that will throw them right back into a, a, a relapse, uh, and, and it's hard for them to feel good about themselves. So one of the things that we do in our foundation is every month we, to, to all the sober living homes that we're aware of in the area, we, we deliver, and I think you've been kind enough to deliver some of those packages for us, we deliver a care package. And you know, for Christmas, we gave everyone an individual gift. I think we had about 150 that, that we send out, but most of the time it's just to the home. It'll be a big basket full of you know full of goodies. Uh, you know maybe we'll sponsor a movie night for them, so they'll be full of popcorn and energy drinks and you know stuff that you know young people in, enjoy, right? Yeah, so yeah. we want them to know that they're loved. We want them to know that there's nothing wrong with them. And that's the message then that carries into the third part of, of, of breaking this stigma to the community at large. We have to begin to change the way we think about addiction, about the disease. We need to see it as a disease. There is no way that we would ever treat anyone that's a family or friend of ours that has cancer the way that we treat people that have addiction. And it's because of the mindset that, that we've developed. And I get it. I was that family. I would continually, uh, I know, ask Zach, why do you keep doing this? Well, I, I was uneducated. Now that I get, that's like asking, that's like asking someone who develops a, a, a brain tumor. Why, why did you do that? I, I mean, uh, when I hear myself say it now, it's, it's so ignorant. But when you're in the middle of that, that frustration, it's hard because we still think that it's a choice, that everyone makes a choice. And make no mistake, for adolescents beginning experimentation, that is a, that is a choice. But guess what we all did as adolescents, as teenagers? We, 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 ex- we experiment. Mm-hmm. You know, as I grew up, I experimented with different jobs. As I grew up, I you know, so I mean, that's part of that's part of our growth process, right? And I often say, you know, no one drinks that first beer hoping that someday oh, I can be an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Man, man, if I could, if I could get to the day when I can, you know, pound down a, a, a you know a quart of whiskey, you know, and and a twelve pack every day, oh, I've arrived. <laughs> that's not that's not in your dream. No. But once but once you cross over into that that level of addiction. 
you no longer have the choice. Once the disease sets in, you no longer have a, have a choice. And there's a lot of factors that de- that develop into that, and and that goes back to what we're doing in the in the, what we're working on developing in the schools, is we realize that that most most addiction most people that end up on that addiction continuum, mm-hmm. all the way at the end have experienced some kind of trauma in in their life, yeah. and empowering parents. To, to maybe see what what may look obviously like trauma to me, to them maybe, well, this is just the way we've always done it. This is the way mom and dad communicate. We yell and scream and d- dad drinks and, you know, sometimes he throws stuff and sometimes it hits us and that's just normal. You know, when you're three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old, that's just normal. You think everyone's family is like yeah. your family. Yeah. You don't know any different. Now, all of a sudden, you become a, a teenager, and you're wondering why you f- feel so lousy all the time, and you find a way not to feel lousy. Yeah. You know, if I just get a little stone, man, I feel good. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that that's everyone's story, but, but trauma is defined differently to, to everyone. And that's what all the new data and the research is showing, that that, that kind of trauma mm-hmm. has so much to do with how we are when we're older. We don't even understand why we react the way we do sometimes to things that take place. And it's like, well, why did I react like that? And then, you know, when you dig deeper, oftentimes it was something that we can relate to in, in our past. So well, yeah, in I a mean, nutshell, that's, uh, <laughs> that's kind of what we're doing now. It's, it's so interesting, though, because the, the new data and research shows that trauma and it's any kind of trauma right yes, it doesn't yes. it's, it, you know it's not just sexual abuse no. it's not just yelling there's there's so many moving parts and and it stresses me out as uh, as, Austin, as a parent you, you have two you have two two little girls right, right? yeah how has how was 2 years ago think about all the kids that went to first grade and then school stopped for a year. Yeah. Right. Children don't understand. You can Absolutely explain not. COVID to them. You can explain all that. Yeah. What ca- that's something that could that could be a catalyst for trauma for them later on in their life. That doesn't mean that every kid, but but it's a marker. And if yeah. we don't if we don't see that, if we don't begin to realize now, then you you pile on top of that. Now maybe somebody has ADD, and you pile on mm-hmm. top of that mm-hmm. someone that has depression. Yeah. And then you pile on top of that, uh, there's a parental divorce. And now all of a sudden, you don't have, like, where everyone experienced not being able to go to school and the trauma of not seeing your friends for up to a year and, and all that. But now you pile on all these other triggers that, that happen on top of that. And now all of a sudden, now you have the makings of someone who is ripe for, you know, for, for addiction. And I think that's how, it, that's how it develops. And I think, and even there's a lot of people, too, that maybe they didn't experience trauma per se, as a kid. However, they have the disease of addiction and, and, and it can develop later on in, in life. That's right. You know, so, um, but I think it's, we, we have to have these conversations uh, because, you know, Zach passed from an overdose, right? Yes, um, yes. And it was it was was it oxycodone or no it? no his his was a uh, heroin and methamphetamine okay over, overdose so he had become he had become addicted to opioids to, okay and it started started it started with oxy right it started with oxy uh, but probably started with Z, with Xanax mm-hmm. he just started you know in the north end of town you know pills are the huge are, are huge and someone asked me one time they said Jim well who is your son's dealer you know mm-hmm. you got to be mad at at somebody and I said probably his mom and I were his first dealers because any parent that has yeah. a leftover prescription in their medicine cabinet and then you have teenagers or they have friends that's their drugstore and not my kid so I don't have to worry about that well guess what yeah. you know I did so I think that you know th- that I'm sure contributed uh, contributed to it and 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 now we've got uh, something that's really taking hold of Central California. There's billboards all over Fresno at least. Yes. Fentanyl kills and it's a picture of a penny. Right. Right? This right. this much on a penny. With a couple what well, looks like a couple grains of salt. Yeah. Next to it. So, um 
the mission of the Zachary Horton Foundation, I would imagine moving forward, is really to work with authorities, community members, to make some kind of impact with, with uh, fentanyl. Abso- right absolutely, uh, and especially with, with fentanyl. So, the, so the, the, the great thing in this battle is that, is that there is an uh, antagonist that will stop an overdose. It's called Narcan. That's right. Yeah. Right? Naloxone is the, is the uh, pharmaceutical name. But Narcan, when someone takes... Because, again, here's what's happening is that people are uh, experimenting. People are, are getting a, a drug that they would normally take, a, 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 you know, a, a Vicodin mm-hmm. or a, uh, you know, a pain reliever or a Xanax for anxiety you know, that they might get from one of their friends, that, but it's 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 not a pharmaceutical one. It's right. been, one that's been made, you know, by some bathroom chemist, right? And they yeah. press it out, they're sold on the street, you know, and they add fentanyl to it because it gives a great high. Yeah. And it doesn't take much. So they're able to really, I mean, make a ton of money with this. But the problem is you get just a little too much and you're dead, yeah. right? Narcan immediately reverses the respo- response to that, and it, and, it saves, and it saves lives. That's part of changing this discussion. We've got to realize, much like having a fire extinguisher in your house mm-hmm. or having seatbelts in your car, you don't expect to get in a car accident. That's not why you put your seatbelt on. You don't expect to start a fire in your house. That's not why you have a fire extinguisher, but you have it there just in case. And Narcan saves lives. Yeah. That's, all the, that's all that we can say. But we have to change the discussion about addiction so people don't think... If someone sees me with Narcan in my house, they must think I'm a heroin addict. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I know. Yeah, that's the, no, yeah. no more than anyone thinks that you're an arsonist because you have <laughs> because you have a fire extinguisher in yeah. your house. That, but it's a perfect but, but analogy. We, but we have to start to think of it that yeah. way, and we've got to get people to think about it that way and look at this as an opportunity for education. Because when the fentanyl crisis ends, make no mistake, something's going to replace oh, yeah, it. Of course, yeah. There's always something there. There's never going to be a shortage of people struggling with addiction. Yeah. We have to change the way that we think about about addiction, the way that we think about about drugs and alcohol, mm-hmm. and change that conversation away from demonizing the person who's involved and educating ourselves about what kind of opportunities we have to continue to work yeah. in the in the community with people that suffer from um, the disease. Thus far, what are some of what are you hearing from community members uh, just within the last couple of months? And, and what are they asking for? Hmm. Uh, I, I, think, I, think, I think that there is a desire r- right now, Austin. People want to hear a message, a message of hope. And I think people are beginning to understand that, you know, I, I, I think it was uh, 19, I think it was 1970, mm-hmm. 71 is when Richard Nixon officially declared the war on drugs. At the same, the, the, the same year, he declared a war on cancer. Now, let's think about that. Let's see. Where has cancer, how many cancers happen now that people survive and live from? Yeah. Where before, it was in the 70s, I remember I had, I had friends. Mm-hmm. My family stayed with a lady who had breast cancer and, and, and passed and left two small children. And we stayed in their home helping them mm-hmm. right during that time. Because there was no, the, the cure wasn't there. But, but through research, right? And, and through, I mean, and, and, and lots of, of, of government funding, through that and also into individual companies that you know that funded and foundations that grew up from that cancer is no longer a, a death s- sentence right. right we understand that our war on drugs until just recently we have continued the same mantra about punishing right. punishing the victim punishing not the drugs we're punishing mm-hmm. the the user we're punishing the person that has the disease mm-hmm. And we've done that, and there is no discernible difference in recovery rates 
from today than there was when the war started than when there was for the previous decades. 50 years so, later. So, so why, yeah, why would you treat a disease the same way for decades and decades if there is absolutely no... <laughs> you change. Yeah. If yeah, this is a war and, and, and we haven't... And, and, and we haven't conquered our enemy, but we just seem to be falling backwards, then we need a new way of fighting it, right? right? Yeah. And I believe, I believe that that's, I think people, they may not be able to verbalize that, but Austin, I think that that's what, that's what they're seeing. So I'm getting a lot of invitations to be able to go into, uh, to, to, talk to, to talk to groups and, and to talk to people. Because people now see, here, here's the challenge is that everyone... But before Zach passed, I never talked about addiction with any of my my friends or or buddies because I was embarrassed. After he passed, almost everyone I talked to, and I'll come to him and and and, and I'll, I'll I'll tell my story. They all say, "Ah, Jim, you know I I had a college roommate that you know we were in we were in baseball together, and you know he had a couple operations and he you know developed a, a, an addiction, you know." Oh, Jim, I had, a, I had an uncle that was an addict. You know, I, I had a grandparent that was an alcoholic. Oh, my gosh, you know, my kids had the same experience. We've all, ex- almost everyone's life has been touched somehow. Just ask yourself, do I know anybody that has been touched by addiction? And chances are, you're going to know somebody. Mm-hmm. One out of every, the, the latest statistics, one out of every 10 people in America suffer with substance use disorder. That's one out of every 10 that suffer with it. All the people that they're in relationships with are affected by their behavior and by things that happen. We've got to find a different way of working with the issue to, again, to bring some of that hope, right? right? Some of that love, some of that acceptance. And that's what the mission of our foundation is about, is, is, is changing that message. We're not the only ones doing this, right. Austin. The, there are people that talk about it even in our own community. I think part of what we want to do is to kind of mobilize that, right? And to and to that end, we had a great we had a great meeting back in uh, back in December where we were able to come together with several of the. And if I can just briefly, I want I want to talk about sure resources in our area because that was something that I didn't know what the resources were and what was available. But we had the great opportunity to bring together. Uh, People from I, I want to say there were ten different. We had we had five uh, private mm-hmm. uh, rehab facilities, and we had a uh, five uh, county funded yeah. uh, type of, of, of facilities. And we brought the leadership from those people together with no agenda except to talk about, you know, wh- wh- what's missing in our community. Yeah. How can we better serve? How can we better reach out? No one was talking about making more money. No one was talking about who was wrong or whose agenda was correct, that wasn't it. The only agenda was how can we help make this crisis better, right? And so when, when you approach it by that, that it's, it doesn't have to be anyone's fault, this is where we're at. How can we, how can we make this better? Um, you've got the podcast. Yes, yes. Every every two weeks, we we have a new weeks. podcast that uh, that releases. Did you have Lisa Smithcamp on yet? Uh, I have the privilege. Uh, Lisa's coming on uh, tomorrow. So tomorrow. So tomorrow yeah. will and and she'll uh, she'll air in in March. So we have we have uh, things set up until March. So I'm I'm very excited. She did uh, uh, the things that she talked about in uh, a, a Channel Thirty. Mm-hmm. Uh, did so you can uh, look that up on YouTube. Um, the, oh, oh, what was it? The it wasn't the killer high because I tried to Google that. But anyway, mm-hmm. it's it's about the fentanyl crisis. Feel the fentanyl. Oh crisis. yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's a documentary. They it's did. a documentary. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah right. that they did, and, and and it's streaming on channel th- on, on channel thirty. Just just fantastic, and the things that she brought, the things that that she talked about inside of that documentary. I want to dig down a little a little deeper right. uh, with her about that. But just so honored to be able to, uh, you know, to have that, and and how challenging it's been. Again, in changing the, the minds of even our uh, of, of our officials right. and the and the people that are the people that are you, you know that, that run our community, you know they're seeing that we need to make a difference. Being able to see a billboard, Austin during 
2020 to 2021, 100,000 people died yeah. from a drug overdose. That's not counting people who died from alcoholism. Right. That's just a drug. 100,000 people. Yeah, it's insane. And, and you know what? There was a, a ticker every night of how many people died from COVID, as there should have been. But when was the last time that you heard this story on a on, on a national newscast or it, something? Yeah, we still don't we still don't talk about it. Right. There were I, I I think I may have said this before. We had three planes go down in a period of a week. Do you remember that a couple of years ago? There were three hundred people plus on each plane mm -hmm. that died. There were seven thirty sevens. They shut down every seven thirty seven in the world. Oh yeah, until they found a solution. A thousand people dead. We've right, we have that many people dying every day. Every day, right? There were three hundred people dying every day from this, and and no sense of urgency about it. And that's again, I think I I believe that's because that's how we that's how we think about that's how we think about substance use. And there's not going to be one easy answer to to this. There is going to take it's going to take every community kind of figuring it out because we didn't get here all in one easy step right, right? so we're going to have to figure out different ways to uh, to attack this issue right attack this problem and in 2022 uh we're going to be going to a number of events uh we've got the golf tournament coming up uh in april right yes yes um, a a april 11th uh, and, uh yeah if, if people uh, look up i think i think in the next in the next couple of weeks we'll have uh information on our foundation website so it's our first fundraiser which is kind of exciting i'm not big into into fundraising but i can find that the you know the more the more money we have, the more that we can see our our, our mission and our vision t take hold. So, so we're reaching out, uh, reaching out to you know to, to others and making that happen. Well, so. um, I am uh, so excited to see what happens this year. Uh, we're going to be at at a, a number of events too, um, and so make sure if you if you see us out there, say hello. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, Austin, you uh, so generously uh, volunteered to. Uh, to kind of uh, chair those community events. So you and I will be at uh, yeah. most of them yeah. or many of them. So uh, yeah, and, and there will be a, uh, there'll be a calendar also on our website and on our uh, a Facebook page that will uh, share those events that are uh, taking place. So we'll have a booth there as often as we can. ZacharyHortonFoundation.org. That's where people can learn more. Yes. I will see you soon. Yes. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Happy New Year. Yes. Happy New Year. <laughs> I'm Austin Reed. You're watching Central Valley Talk.